I guess. Uh, I remember the last time I was here was in 1984, September of 84, about uh, five years ago, and met uh, uh, your pastor, uh, Brother Bill uh, Hendricks and Sandy, and I'd like to uh, advertise their singing some, too. I wondered if they were going to do it. I, I told Brother Bill one time that uh, I had... Uh, uh, their record of he and Sandy singing, and uh, we went to sleep by it at night. And I, I hope that comes out uh, right, but they, <laughs> we played that over and over again and enjoyed that uh, that good uh, that good music uh, very much. So, uh, I'm going to tell you my story tonight about why I believe, as I do, about Bible versions. I'm just going to uh, rehearse my story to you as a as a, uh, a pastor, and uh, I assure you that I'm no scholar. I've never been a scholar. I'm a pastor of a fundamental Bible-believing Baptist church. I've been in a pastor since 1962, and at my present uh, church for the past 16 years, it'll be uh, next month. So I come to you as a just as a as a pastor. And uh, still learning in these uh, particular uh, areas. Uh, would you please stand with me together as we look to the Lord in prayer? Our Father, tonight we need your help and your blessing and presence upon that which is to be spoken here. I pray for the anointing of the Spirit of God, uh, for the aid of the Holy Spirit to enlighten me in terms of. Uh, uh, dealing uh, on this particular subject so that we may have a better grasp and understanding of it. And I pray that it may be a fruitful time for those that are gathered, that I may uh, be forbidden to talk over anyone's head and to be a uh, uh, servant of God here in this evening hour. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, they told me that you need to begin low and go slow. And the reason I'm real slow right now, again, is because we normally have about a half hour to warm up uh, up here, and I'm absolutely astounded we're getting started uh, so quick. But I'd like to take you to a few verses in the Bible just to get started here, because I do have some fixed positions on this particular subject. I've been interested in it for the last 18 years, and the last, I think, probably 15 vitally interested in it and have read uh, somewhat on the subject. The psalmist said in Psalm 57, 7, My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. And then he said in Psalm 108 and verse 1, O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise even with my glory. And again, the psalmist said in Psalm 112 and verse 7, He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. Then I have another text found in the 16th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. The Lord Jesus is, uh, is giving the story, the account here, of the rich man who lifts up his eyes, being in torment, the rich man in hell, and he's making a request of Abraham. And I speak to you from the 26th verse of Luke chapter 16, and this is the narrative, this is the Word of God. Beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And so, in Jesus' words, Abraham is here answering the rich man. Now, by application, not interpretation, but by application, I would like to say that there is a great gulf that is fixed between the received text, which produced this Bible, the Old Testament Mesoretic text, and the New Testament received text, which produced this Bible, the authorized King James Version of the Bible, 
and every other version that is on the market. There is a great gulf. There's a major difference in, uh, in the versions, and uh, we uh, need to understand that. Many people do not understand that there is a, a tremendous difference. And I'm going to be telling you a little bit about that as I just give you my narrative on my own life story here tonight uh, uh, concerning the versions. And again, why I believe as I do about Bible versions. I'd like to say to you that I'm pretty well set in concrete on the subject. And I've read uh, quite a bit on both sides of it. And tonight, in, if uh, you uh, will allow the term in lay, layman's language, I'd like to, to speak to you. I've never liked the difference between the clergy and, and the layman anyway. I, that's just uh, something that's sort of understood. But I'm going to be uh, talking with you and try to speak down where you can understand what I am talking about. I was soundly converted to Jesus Christ on December the 8th, 1957. Soundly saved. Never had a problem from that day to this about Bible separation. Old tobacco went uh, that way, and, and the old liquor went that way, and a lot of other things went the other way. And I began to speak in a new tongue, if you will. The old tongue didn't talk like it used to talk after I got saved. I've always felt that that is what God would expect of anybody that's converted to Christ. You know, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And I've always had a sneaking uh, question mark about those that never had a change of lifestyle when they genuinely got saved. So I was soundly converted at the age of 25, 1957. I was married and had a baby girl less than four months old. And I remember back in those days, I didn't realize that you could buy a Bible in just about any uh, ten-cent store in any town. And so we saved up at, while I was under conviction by the Spirit of God to be saved, saved up our S&H green stamps. You remember those? And we got those S&H green stamps together, and I said to my wife, would you please allow that I would be able to get me a good Bible. This was before I was saved, and she was glad to do it too. My uh, wife was uh, raised up, if I may say it, and, and uh, no offense meant down in this particular area, down in Little Egypt. And they all, you know, they got, uh, uh, they had the Bible. Most of the time they just preached salvation, nothing else. And my wife was saved in a little Nazarene tent revival meeting when she was 16 years of age, and she really didn't know beans from apple butter about Bible separation. You know, you've got to get into the Bible if you're going to be uh, dealing with Bible separation. And so she had a little bit of a, a time uh, with that when I was first uh, saved. She thought I needed shock treatments, and my elevator had blown a fuse, and my clutch was slipped, and all of those types of things. And pretty soon, uh, when I announced that I was called to preach, why, uh, she finally submitted to that, and then she had a little problem, and some of her tires went flat also. You understand what I'm talking about? If a person's going to live for the Lord Jesus Christ, why, well, he's going to be different. He's not the same. He's a brand new creature. That's Bible, and that's what we're interested in. And so, uh, I quit about everything there was to quit and got an extreme interest in the Bible. Very much interested in the Bible. Had a little New Testament. Had the kind of a job in the place that I lived that, uh, and worked uh, that uh, I could spend some time reading it on the job. That was legitimate, no problem, because I was doing my job and I devoured the Bible, the New Testament. Spent lots and lots of time in the New Testament. And I used to tell everybody uh, everything I knew. It took me about two minutes and I got most of it mixed up. You understand what I'm talking about tonight? But the Bible, the Word of the living God, was the whole key to the position I'm in right now. I hearken to the Bible immediately after I was saved. And if you do that, there's something that's going to happen. Anybody that will get into the Bible is going to be interested in winning other people to Jesus. And I talked to all kinds of people about the Lord Jesus. I didn't know but what there was only one Bible around, and I figured I had it. I didn't know there were all kinds of versions. And I'll assure you there weren't as many versions then as there are today. I mean, it wasn't the big thing back in that day, to look at a lot of versions. I thought there was only a King James Bible. But then in witnessing for the Lord Jesus, I found soon as I come up, uh, upon those that 
that uh, were Catholic people, they told me that uh, there was another Bible. So they had a Bible, a Catholic Bible. Oh, I said, you do? Well, I better find out about it then. So I think I went to my pastor. Somebody told me at least. And you know, memory is a poor historian. It really is. And I, I went, I think, to my pastor and asked him about it. He told me, he said, Bob, I want you to know that, uh, that the, the, the Protestant Bible, the Bible we use, is, is, is a good Bible, but said the, the, uh, the Roman Catholics have a Bible. And the only difference in the two Bibles is simply that the Roman Catholic Bible was translated from the original Greek and Hebrew into the Latin and from the Latin into our language. And the Bible we have was translated from the original Greek and Hebrew into our language. So I said, fine, that's good. So we look in John 3, 3, Amen, Amen, I say unto thee, you must be born again. And the King James, they, uh, verily, verily, and those kind of differences. So for the longest time, I was telling people that uh, if they had a Catholic Bible, it's all right, you can use that, because it was just going through another language, through Latin and then into our own language. That's what I understood. I'm giving you my testimony tonight about how I came to the place that I am. And uh, so I figured then there are just two Bibles, that's all, just uh, the Protestant Bible and the Roman Catholic Bible, especially the Reims Douay Version. said that's the best one. And so uh, this was my testimony as I started, and I spoke with fervency and conviction because I got into the Bible. Anybody who gets into the Bible is going to have conviction. They're going to believe something. They say this is the authoritative Word of God. This is God speaking to us. And that's the way I felt about it. And so I spoke with great conviction, trying to win people to Christ. was not especially successful along those lines, but I was working at it uh, for sure. And so uh, this helped me a great deal. But I learned better at Bible college. I took up writing a little gospel track in the uh, in the spring of 1958, after I was saved in 1957, and in December, took up, wrote my little Bible uh, tract, uh, trying to offset the covenant theology that permeated the, the, the Dutch Reformed area in Grand Rapids and Holland, Michigan. Holland, where I was saved, the First Baptist Church there. It was the third pew from the back. I know because I knelt there, and my sinner's prayer was, Oh, God, that's all I said. But the Spirit of God had been working in my life, and the faithful pastor was preaching from the good old book, and he was telling me that sinners needed to be saved. So after I got saved, a lot of things got uh, settled at that time. So I wrote a tract in the spring of 1958, and then in the fall, I announced to my wife, I'm called to preach and go to preach. And so uh, I quit my job, took off with the Grand Rapids Baptist Bible Institute. And the pastor of the Wealthy Street Baptist Church at that time, that's where the issue was held, Dr. David Otis Fuller. And so I went to school there. And then I discovered at the Bible Institute that there was a, there was a third Bible. There had to be. I, I suppose there was, a, there was a, a third Bible, or maybe even more than that, because one day while I was listening to my professor, great professor, love the Lord, I could not wait to get into my Bible classes. i have been born again, got into those Bible classes. I'll never forget that uh, E. Gordon Ray, missionary to the Philippines, been there for a few years. He was about in his middle 40s, I think, at that time. I talked with him just last month, called him up, lives out in Oregon now, Dr. E. Gordon Ray, and I reminded him of what he had said to me in the Job and Galatians class. I haven't the slightest notion why he said what he did. I suspicion why he may have. It may have been a student had asked a question that provoked him to say it, and it may have been some uh, fussing in the back room with some of the professors, because this professor said in the presence of all of us, and again, I didn't know enough to put in the symbol about the Bible, just learning and feeding my family and burning the candle at both ends because I was saved and was called to pre preach and was preparing myself. And this pastor, or this uh, professor said uh, in that class, if the King James Version was good enough for the Apostle Paul, good enough for me. Now, I was a beginner. I was just getting started. Again, I didn't know anything. And uh, probably the other students knew that that professor didn't mean that to be taken literally. I reminded him of that last week when I called, or last month when I called him. And he said, you know that I didn't. Well, I said, of course. I know that you were just making a point, that you were going to stay with that Bible. 
But uh, I suppose at that time, I said, well, that sells it for me. If the Apostle Paul's for it, then I'm for it. That was good enough, you know, settled it all right there. And, of course, he was, uh, again, just trying to make a, uh, make a point. But I also knew, because I'd been receiving the sword of the Lord, I knew that the, the Revised Standard Version was another version. But all the fundamentalists back then lambasted it, and I just joined with them. I figured if the people that led me to Jesus were against the Revised Standard Version, then I was going to be against it also. And they cited one verse. As far as I knew, there was only one verse in the Bible that they were all against and said if they missed it in one place, then we're against it. It was uh, Isaiah 7:14. They put in there, instead of a virgin, they put in a young woman. And so I read the sword of the Lord and other fundamental pastors who would come to the pulpits in those days and they would say, this book does not contain the Word of God. This book is the Word of God. I believe that. I still believe it. I'm not sure all that said it back then really believed it, but I believe they told the truth and I believe it for sure. And so we shuttled the Revised Standard Version because of the virgin that was taken out of the young woman uh, that was put in there. But today, the New American Standard Version, they put in the, uh, they put in virgin back in, but then they put in the, in the footnotes, or, uh, maiden, I believe it is, they, they operate like that, so it's either or, uh, for them. And, uh, so I knew then about three versions. Three of them. They're all right. I, I guess they're all okay, except the Revised Standard. The Roman Catholic was okay. As, as far as I was concerned then, because it only went through that other language, the, from the original Greek and Hebrew into the Latin and then into the English, so that sounded pretty good to me. Revised Standard Version is no good because it does a bad job concerning the virgin birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so I found that there were three versions. But then, of course, that's not all. I went then, after one year at the... Uh, Grand Rapids Baptist Bible Institute. I then transferred to Omaha. I was disappointed in some ways there at the, at the school. And I ought to say also that the reason that I believe that possibly uh, the uh, uh, professors were hassling about this in the back room and that, that was the motivation to help uh, E. Gordon Ray, I'm not sure it was, but if that was the motivation, uh, it, it could have been because I do know that one of the professors that was there as a librarian at that particular time. Dr. Joe Crawford is still there, and he is a fervent champion of the NIV, that eclectic text that uh, is uh, uh, not the Word of God at all. It, it's no more than an eclectic text, and so we say it, it may be, that version would contain the Word of God, but it's not the Word of God. That's the position that this pastor takes, and, and I believe that we can uh, document that. Uh, and be sure about what I'm saying. Have letters, uh, names, and so forth, confirmation on those particular matters. Uh, so then we transferred to the Omaha Baptist Bible College, Omaha, Nebraska, which is now Faith Baptist Bible College in Ankeny, Iowa. And while we were there, of course, I now had two children. I had a little boy born out there about as soon as we got there. And we went through great trials out there, both materially and uh, uh, in, in other, other, physically and, and materially, went through some great trials. But they were good for us. You know, trials are good for you. Thank God for them. But I love the doctrine class. All Christian people I love the Bible. We have lots of things to learn from the Bible. And I love the Bible doctrine class. They were teaching one day on the doctrine of the Scriptures. Doctrine of the Scriptures. I was working hard, needed two sticks to keep my eyes open, and and uh, spending very little time uh, with my family because of working and studying, and it didn't all come easy uh, for me. About the only recreation we had was, uh, remember back when uh, McDonald's were only the arches and you didn't have a place to sit down, 15 cent hamburgers. Our great celebration each week on Friday was getting some hamburgers and some french fries. You'd get a hamburger and a french fry for 30 cents, 15 cents each. That was all the recreation we had. And the doctrine class, and I was learning all that I could, and my soul was absolutely thrilled with the Word of God from all, all of that time, and it still is, by the way, thrilled by the Word of God, and uh, being sure that we're going to heaven because we've trusted the Savior that is given to us in this blessed book right here that we use today. This is the Word of God in the English language. 
And so, as I, uh, as I listened in that doctrine class, one day the professor said uh, to the entire class, he said to them something like this. He said, it is always best to preach from the King James Version of the Bible. Best to preach from the King James Version of the Bible. But he said, if you want to study in your study, you need the 1901 ASV to study from. And why? Because it is nearest to the original manuscript. I'm just a young fellow, less than three years saved in the, in the Bible uh, Institute out there. At that time, later it was a Bible college, and now they've gone on from there. But uh, I was just a young man and uh, not getting hold of much, but this much registered. You've got a logical mind, it registered. I said to myself, why in the world would I take a Bible and preach from a Bible from my pulpit and use a better Bible to study from? To me, that was just a sensible thing to, to consider. You study from the Bible that is nearest to the original manuscript in your study, but you come and you preach from the King James Bible. And I was trying to shake that off. You know, I, I felt like the, I felt like the, the absent-minded professor that was going uh, uh, through the, the doors, had one of these turning doors, and he was going around it, and he said, Bless me, I'm not sure if I'm coming in or going out. You know, that, that was his attitude on that. And I thought, what in the world is happening here? But that's what they told me. They said the 1901 ASV is the best Bible to study from because it's nearest the original manuscript. And I said, well, why in the world? So I went back and talked with the professor, just asked him a simple question, and I had to uh, make a beeline for work. I had to work immediately after that. And I don't remember what the professor... And I, I want to remind you, uh, these were God-fearing good men. The virgin was not a big question back in then. These were men that were about that. Love Christ, love the Bible and all that. But they had just followed and taught in turn. So I did not get any satisfaction for my own mind and I figured, well, there are a lot of other things that I've been thinking about, and I've got a wrestle over in my mind as well, and I haven't gotten those all settled, and so I'll just wait on this, put it on the back burner. But I'm going to tell you what was taking place then. Subliminally, now you know what that's all about. Subliminally, I had some little thoughts. They were jumping up on my brain, and they were etching some things on my brain. Just walking and making some grooves in my brain, and it went back to what that first professor had said. If the King James was good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for me. And I followed those etchings for a long time. I knew now that the Apostle Paul had long since gone when the King James Version came on the scene. But those implants were of tremendous value to me because I was just a young man had one thing in mind, wanted to obey the Bible. That's all. Not interested in anything else. And I'm still not interested in climbing ladders. I'm tired to death about that. Somebody wanted to climb some ecclesiastical ladder. Dear friend, the only ladder that we ought to want to climb is the ladder that God gives us to climb. Growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to do it through this old book right here. And so now... I know that there were four versions, just four of them. The King James Version, the Catholic Bible, the RSV, and the 1901 ASV. Just four, as far as I knew. Now, there were more, of course, but I didn't know about them. Then, in 1962, I graduated from college, went to pastor a little church, and left that church. I was there about a year. In 1964, I moved over into the Pontiac, Michigan area, and took a little, uh, a little uh, a, a Galleon Baptist Mission Church. And uh, when I got into that church, I needed some study material. I was preaching at the uh, truck and coach uh, car factory in Pontiac, Michigan. Preached every day. Enjoyed that thoroughly. Got up about 30, 40, 50 old rough-hewn, tobacco-chewing, uh, uh, godless men come in. Listen, they preach the gospel and work at trying to get them saved. Had a wonderful time doing that. And I didn't have much time because I was still feeding the family. So I needed some help. So I picked up Dr. R.A. Torrey's little booklet, little Moody Cole Portis booklet, entitled Difficulties in the Bible. Difficulties in the Bible. 
nice little book teach you a lot of nice things, but there were some things in there that were not going to help. And I remember when I commenced to teach on that subject, I had some old men in that church, and I think that there were a couple of them, when you weren't looking, were chewing a little tobacco, doing something like that. Now, we're not for that kind of thing, but I believe they were, they were doing it, and, uh, and I think there was a mason or two in there also. But I started teaching the Bible, and of course, I'm not for those things, and I started teaching, I was using this, uh, this little booklet, Difficulties in the Bible, by Dr. R.A. Torrey. And I got over to John chapter 5 and verse 4, talking about some of the difficulties with the text. And as I got into uh, John chapter 5 and verse 4, I read this verse. For an angel went down at a certain season into a pool and troubled the water, Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And then I commenced to instruct these old men in that class, and others were there also. I commenced to instruct them on the teaching that Dr. Torrey had given on that verse. And this, I'm going to quote to you what Dr. Torrey had to say. His comment on that reads as follows. He said, This statement, for many reasons, seems improbable, and difficult to believe, but upon investigation we find that it is all a mistake of the copyist. Some early copyists reading John's account added in the margin his explanation of the healing properties of this intermittent medicinal spring. A late copyist embodied this marginal note in the body of the text, and so it came to be handed down and got into the authorized version. Very properly it has been omitted from the revised version." You know what those old men said to me? You know what they dared to say to their young pastor at that time? They said to me very kindly, said, Pastor, we believe that's the Word of God. And I had a sneaking hunch in the back of my mind because I had these little old thoughts that kept jumping up and down and walking up and down and making that groove even heavier on my brain. And it kept saying to me, if the King James Version was good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for me. And, of course, I knew better. I already told you that. But these old men, when they got done, I said to them, You know, men, I've always questioned what Dr. Torrey said also. And I don't remember exactly how that came about, but I just told them that we wouldn't be doing any more questioning of the Bible that we had in our hands. And they were appreciative of that. But then I had another etching that was up there that had come from the professor that I listened to in Omaha. And he said, the best version nearest to the original manuscript is a 1901 ASV. So I got two of these little fellows walking up and down, and the first professor was making more of an implant than the other, doing something along those particular lines. After this, after this, after they had talked with me, then... We moved to Sheboygan, Michigan. I was in Sheboygan, started a brand new work up there with the Galilean Baptist Mission, Faith Baptist uh, Church in, in Sheboygan. And this is when the versions were coming out. Had a version, uh, uh, the, the Living Bible, of course, was out. Uh, the, the Living Letters, they'd come out and I think started about 1965, 66. 67, the Old Testament, New Testament, the Gospels and living letters and so forth. And I was quoting a little bit from them on Wednesday night. I always brought my King James to the, to the pulpit. And uh, I remember that a rich lady had a rich lady converted in our church, and she, brought, she bought me a living Bible. And I'd quote a little bit from that on, on Wednesday night. And then I went to a youth rally one evening, one Saturday evening, after my own children and in the, uh, in the uh, youth in that age uh, bracket. And, and we went to a youth uh, meeting uh, in a little church in uh, uh, Okyok, Michigan, Millersburg, down there in, in Okyok. And, and uh, this fellow, John Crabb, a pastor from Central Michigan University, pastored the Strickland Baptist Church uh, down in, uh, near uh, Mount Pleasant, Michigan. And uh, he came to the meeting to speak and while he was there, he started this way, talking to... I mean, there was a house full of young people up there. We had quite a few ourselves in that place. And he started out by making an apology. I wondered why in the world he was apologizing. 
But he said, I need to make an apology as I begin here tonight and to uh, apologize for passing out literally hundreds of uh, versions called Good News for Modern Man. And I said to myself, what in the world is this man apologizing here for? Unless he had a, a, some young person that was going to Central Michigan was up in that youth rally. But he apologized, wanted to clear himself. He said, I did not realize what they had done to the blood of Jesus Christ in uh, Good News for Modern Man. And so that made an etching. And I started thinking, here we come out with the Berkeley version of the Bible. And here we come out with all these new versions, always, constantly, year after year, a new version. And some of us had supposed that the only thing the versions were doing, the new ones, was to update some words. Just updating a few words. And I said to myself, how in the world do you need to update words every other year? And it didn't make sense to me. And then we purchased Dr. David Otis Fuller's Quitch Bible. Oh, Dr. Fuller, bless his soul. He was a tremendous, and still is a tremendous uh, promoter of the truth of the Word of God. And this book has done more, probably, than any other book to get the fire started in the hearts and the minds of people. And I read the book. One day, and this is when I met Pastor Bob Barnett, my friend and colleague of many, many years, over 18 years he's been at, the, at his church there in Grayling. And, and we were teaching a little Bible institute there in Gaylord, Michigan. And I'll never forget uh, one day uh, we got into the class. I have this all dated because I have the date when the pastor of that church gave us this, uh, this book right here. We were in it. We were fundamentalists, and we thought everybody was in there, and separatists, Brother Bob and I were. I didn't know that about him then. He didn't know it about me. But on March the 27th, 1973, we were given this book. And the pastor announced that he was president of that Bible Institute up there in Gaylord, and he announced that he would be joining with the Minister of Association and passing out Touched by the Fire. It's the good news for modern man. That's what it is. And uh, he was going to do that. And I was thunderstruck at that. I could not imagine why in the world anybody would do that. Because not only that I love my Bible, my King James Bible is beginning to get the idea then, spent a lot of time reading it, but also the, the thing that goes with the love for this book, and you mark it down, the thing that goes for a genuine love for this book is Bible separation. Don't you dare tell me otherwise. I know better. It goes hand in glove all together. If a man loves the Word of God, he is going to love Bible separation and be separated from the world and also ecclesiastically. I was thunderstruck at this. And so when I got home, I didn't say much. I was also tongue-tied. Thunderstruck and tongue-tied. And that sometimes is good and sometimes it's not so good. But I was glad that it happened at that time. I got home and all the way that 50 miles of traveling on that Tuesday night, I said to myself, I've got to talk to him about this. I said, I when I got home and wrote the pastor a letter. And I said, if you pursue the course of going with those liberals and that minister of association and passing out this book that John Crabb just a few weeks before had said uh, that he apologized for passing it out to hundreds of Central Michigan University students. I said, if you do that, I just want you to know that I'm all through teaching. I'm finished with it. And that, dear brother... That dear brother who also wanted to do the right thing. Now, don't be mean to him. He wanted to do the right thing. He wanted to win souls to Christ. And he thought he was doing the right thing here. And he called me. He said, I'm sorry. I'm not going to... We won't do that. I'm going to explain to them why. So I won't do it. And then he sent a letter out to all the pastors, about seven or eight pastors that were teaching in that institute. And Bob, Brother Bob was, was one of those. And we, we, we met together... And, brother, we knew who was separated then. We found out in a hurry we got in that meeting. Some of those pastors, some of them old enough, they ought to have better sense than that. Boo-hooing because you weren't going to win souls. I'm going to tell you something. The greatest call that any person has, any Christian has, is to follow the truth of God, not endeavor to just win souls at any cost. I don't believe people are won to Jesus Christ by compromising the Word of God. And so we began to move in that area. Not only so, but just a little bit before that, I'd gotten in touch with this little pamphlet right here, What's Wrong with Key 73? 
put out by Dr. D.A. Waite. He probably doesn't remember this. But I sent for it, and I read that, and we fussed against T-73. And I remember going and preaching in Brother Bob's church. We were both just getting started in these particular areas. But what a time we had when we finally got on the right, uh, the right side. Then I moved to Holland, Michigan. Four and a half years in, in Sheboygan, Holland, or in uh, uh, Harrison, Michigan. After being here for four and a half years in, in Sheboygan, we called to Holland, Michigan, or to uh, uh, Harrison, Michigan, and uh, Dr. Fuller sent a note out. He sent a note to pastors, I suppose, maybe all over the country. But uh, in it, he said that he was uh, now had retired from uh, uh, the Wealthy Street Baptist Church, been there over 40 years, and he was retired from it, and he was going about the country to the churches that would have him, and he, I remember so much uh, what had taken place because this uh, uh, Dr. Fuller, had, uh, he had a picture of himself in front of his vehicle, and he had his little derby on, had a briefcase in his hand, and uh, the caption was, Have Answers, We'll Travel. So we invited him to come. He came to, uh, uh, to Harrison, and when he got into Harrison, I remember on June the 12th, 1974, on a Wednesday afternoon, we had 80 pastors and laymen there, had him come in and listen to the story about the Bible, the Word of God, and the importance of staying with the received text, the King James Version of the Bible. And so I followed him around. didn't have many answers then. He had the answers. I was trying to get them. And it was kind of hard going into, into this, uh, uh, this gray matter because you remember these two little fellows had already walked up and down on there. And one said, the King James Version is good enough the Apostle Paul, good enough for me. And the other one said uh, that the 1901 ASV was the nearest to the original manuscript. And Doc Fuller was going to get us straightened around on the what was what. So Doc Fuller came. I remember following him many places. He had a meeting in the West Branch, Michigan with uh, Harry Blaylock was a pastor then. And uh, then he had a, a meeting over in Cadillac, Michigan. R.V. Paulson was the author of that little book, Eeny, Meeny, Miny, Mo, to which translation should we go? I read that book and other books, and I was taking our people around. We finally set up for him. I was a member of the Central Michigan Association, one of the uh, councilmen there. I set up a meeting for Doc Fuller over in the Clara Baptist Church, right next door to us, 16 miles down the road. And I remember that, uh, that uh, a doc came in there and they had a question and answer for his dealing on this subject. And those pastors, you see Doc Fuller, had been in the fellowship I'm with at JRBC. He had been there uh, all his life, as far as I know. For 40s, he was there when it started, all the life of the JRBC. And uh, Dr. Fuller uh, was laughed at by a couple of pastors there. They asked him a question. Doc Fuller didn't answer the question. Now, it may be that he didn't hear it correctly. And it may be that he got sidetracked. But the question that they asked Dr. Fuller was a question on my mind. I said, yeah, he's got to answer that. And this was the question. It went something uh, like this. Uh, Dr. Fuller, if you believe that KJZ is the version that should be used, how do we account for the Bibles in other languages? And I said to myself, that's the question I've had. How can you account for Bibles in other languages? They don't have King James English in Spanish and in German and other uh, languages like that. And I, I didn't have hold of that. And he didn't answer it. I'm, I'm sure he knew the answer, but he must have misunderstood the question or something. And I listened to these pastors. I was ashamed of them. And if my old carnal nature had, had uh, really gotten riled up, I might have done something about it. I just let it go. But they laughed and snickered at this good pastor who had given uh, yeoman service to the JRBC and to fundamentalism all the days of his life and all the days of the uh, JRBC at that particular time. But I found out in a hurry after studying a little more that the versions are not the problem and they have never been the problem. The underlying problem on this problem we talk about with all the versions, they're just the leaves on the tree. The root problem are two old bastard manuscripts the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus manuscript that have fostered all the trouble. Most of the versions that you have on the market today, probably all of them, will, will uh, have the influence of uh, uh, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus upon them. These old manuscripts that were discarded, and yet Kitchendorf found Sinaiticus, 
1859, and he elevated that. And because he was something of a German scholar, this man made tremendous impact. And that, of course, is the reason we have the trouble with all the versions today, because of those old manuscripts that were not indeed good manuscripts. They were corrupt manuscripts. Well, I'm going to just wind up here because we could go on, but the de devil aims his guns at the KJV. He aims to corrupt. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 17, We are not as many which corrupt the Word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God and the sight of God, speak we in Christ. We're taught that this Bible that we have, that we're taught that, that the Word of God is in, in the world today. It's where the grass withers. That's what it says in Isaiah 40. That's what it says in the book of 1 Peter. It's where the grass withers. There's no withering grass in, in uh, uh, heaven because withering grass speaks of death. And so uh, the, the King James Bible is, is the Bible. It, it's God's Word uh, for this particular age. And so uh, when, we, uh, when we think about, uh, we, we think about uh, the preservation of the Word of God, we realize that if you do not have preservation, inspiration is of no value. And as far as I'm concerned, I understand that the Bible that I have here is not in itself, as the Dean Burgon physician says, it's not in itself inspired. That is, it's not inspired like a original manuscript. But for me, practical inspiration is important because we've got to have the Word of God in our language today, the Word of God that lives and abides forever. So in a practical sense, as far as I'm concerned, this is the verbally inspired Word of the living God. I have no problem with that. I mean, it's a wonderful and important uh, uh, subject. So I believe in practical inspiration and that my Bible has the breath of God on it. Then I make one other statement and I'm all finished. You do not educate people by taking the Word of God down to their level. You educate people by bringing them up to the level of the Word of God. That's the way you do it. And I remember listening to D. Martin Lloyd-Jones and his a tremendous little statement. I don't know much about his theology in other areas, but, but this man is recognized in, in areas of scholarship. And this D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, author of many books and so forth, he said it as clear as anybody could say it. He talked about the old illiterate coal miners, one to the Lord Jesus Christ, when these terms like reconciliation justification, some other terms that are counted too big for the ordinary man to understand. When the Word of God was preached with the power of the Holy Spirit of God, these men came to Christ and they learned to read and they learned because they were brought up to the Bible. You use the Bible to lift men up to it. You don't take it down there and corrupt it like this kind of stuff that you have right here. So we got a Bible. Wonderful. Praise God. Here it is. Authorized King James Bible. And uh, I thank you very much for these few minutes to say so.